right, everyone. Welcome to Refreshable Braille Displays, Two Truths and a Lie Ooh. <laughs> by Cody LaPlante. Um, this is being brought to you by MSB's Outreach Department um, as part of our Braille Challenge webinar series. This is Cody's last one in his three-part series, but they will be posted on Maryland School for the Blind's YouTube page. Um, just give me a little bit of time to do that. Um, there's going to be um, one more presentation on March 11th, and I will share that with you later um, about career education through the years. I am now going to formally introduce Cody. Cody is a TBI. He believes all people with visual impairments can have complete computer access skills. He has a master's degree and a graduate certificate in assistive technology. He co-founded IT to provide live and asynchronous training options to children, adults, professionals, and parents to ensure that all people with visual impairments can have access to a computer like everyone else. Um, we are so happy that um, everyone has joined us and um, we're gonna be using the chat feature um, if you have um, any questions and we'll be periodically checking that out. And then we're just gonna have a brief poll that I will do at the end, but I know Cody's gonna be asking you some poll questions along the way. And now I'm gonna go ahead and let Cody take it away. Cool. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you guys so much for um, coming and uh, spending your evening or afternoon with us, uh, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you didn't get that document, it, it, it is in the uh, chat box. It's a Google Doc and it should look like this. It says the uh, Maryland Regional Braille Challenge up at the top. Um, now, this webinar is called Braille Displays Two Truths and a Lie, and it will become a little bit um, evident why we are calling it two truths and a lie. Um, if you've ever played the game two truths and a lie, um, where you have to, where you're given three statements and you have to de decide which one is the lie, that's going to be what we're going to be playing uh, in just a little bit um, about braille displays. Now, of course, if, if you have been to our last couple of uh, uh, last weeks and the weeks before, um, really what we're trying to do in this, and you can read the objectives, but what we're trying to do here is kind of understand better what a braille display is, what, why do we use braille displays and how does it fit into our programming? And hopefully along the way, we'll get some, um, like, uh, some tips, tricks and, and, and things that you can use a braille display for and, and really st uh, starting to understand um, how we control the braille display through whatever operating system we're using, okay? So you can take a look at our objectives there, um, but we're gonna get started right in with a poll because we wanna make this a little bit interactive. You can uh, click on the poll in the document just by clicking on, on this link, or if you have your phone and you'd rather use the text feature, you can open your text message app. You're gonna text, the number you're gonna text is 37, 37607. And the message you are going to text is Cody L901. So you can do it that way too, but you can just click on that link as well. And you should be brought to our first question. And of course, the first question um, as we had last week is what is your role? Um, just kind of letting us know what, uh, who are you? Are you a uh, uh, somebody who has a visual impairment that is using this information uh, for themselves? Are you a vision for professional? Are you a parent? Um, are you a university professor or are you somebody else? We do get a lot of TVIs and it looks like right now, or I'm sorry, TVI, O&M, CADIS, VRT, those vision professionals, it looks like that's mainly who we have, okay? So I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to, um, to tell us who they are. Uh, and of course, if you haven't put in the chat box, we'd love to hear who, where you are from. I, I saw, ooh, other, I would love to hear whoever put other in the, um, in the poll, I would love to hear what your role is in the chat box if you want to put that in. Um, yeah, it's really great to see everybody um, too from around the country, really get those different perspectives. Cool. Awesome. So I'm going to move on to the next question. The next question, we're going to get a little bit into Braille displays, all right? So I'm going to activate that one. You should see it pop up. And this one is, what are your pain points with Braille displays? This one, you can type an entire answer, right? Well, I guess you can either type an entire answer, or if you see an answer that you like, you can either upvote it or downvote it um, to say, yeah, I, I agree with that one. Um, you know, that is another pain point that I have. So, so we can kind of see where everybody's pain points are. This is really important um, as we start to keep, go, uh, as we continue with the webinar, 
because we want to make sure that we answer some of these questions. Really, I want to know is like, why, why did you guys um, come to a webinar on Braille displays? What are we looking for here? I want to make sure that, that we kind of answer these questions. Sometimes they're temperamental. For sure, they are definitely temperamental sometimes. They freeze. Absolutely, they freeze. Yeah. Braille displays, and this is something that we're, we're, we really are not going to get into a ton in this webinar, but Braille displays are, um, oh, I love it. We're going to get to that one too. Um, our Braille, Braille displays are something that, um, we're, that really are not founded on, I would say, stable technology. Something like Windows 10 is very stable technology. It has a lot of different users. They have a lot of different data so that when there's a bug, they get the information quickly and update it. Right? Braille displays, because there's such a small market, are not really updated a lot. They're not, they, they spend so much money on the, the Braille cells and the Braille technology that things like Bluetooth chips sometimes are not the best. Um, and that's where we get these freezing and, and temperamental behaviors for sure. What is the rubric for choosing to upgrade uh, to more cells for a student? Man, I wish I, I, I wish I had an answer for that. I'm not sure that there is one. Um, not that one that I've seen. If, if anybody does have an answer to that question, please let us know in the chat. I would love to see a rubric for choosing to upgrade. Um, and I don't know if it's, if it's as straightforward as that for sure. Con connectivity with a computer, we're definitely gonna go over that. Um, but back to this rubric, yeah, I think that choosing to upgrade, I, I, I wouldn't look at it as choosing to upgrade more as what needs are your student, uh, is your, does your student need, right? So if you have a 14 cell braille display, that might be really good for an adult who's a proficient braille reader that needs something that they can slip into their pocket and bring around with on their phone, right? So it's not necessarily upgrading, um, but more like what is the, what are the needs? Not having as much hands-on experience with them. Yeah, for sure. And guess what? There's We're going to do some stuff today that that um, we'll show you kind of, you don't really need the braille display to get some hands-on experience. We can show you kind of how to get to that hands-on experience. Really good products are still operable, but a company won't support the firmware any longer. Yep, that is the, man, talk about the epitome of braille displays, the not supporting the firmware for sure. So, okay, this gives me a kind of a good idea as to what your pain points are, um, especially this not, uh, the connectivity with a computer, not having as much hands-on experience, we, we can definitely answer in this webinar for sure. Um, so we'll go on to the next question here. That should be activated. And then this one, this is where we have two truths and a lie. My question for you is which one is the lie? The three uh, choices are, is this the lie? A braille display is a necessary piece of equipment for a screen reader user that also reads braille, right? Is that the lie? Is it a braille display is a device which you must uh, you must learn to use? Is that one the lie? Or is it all braille displays fundamentally work the same way? So we got a couple of answers here between B and C. All right. So the way that, and as you guys answer this, the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna kind of leave this question open for right now. We're gonna leave this question open. We're not really gonna talk about it much more, um, but then at the end of the webinar, I'm gonna clear the responses and we are gonna answer this question again and see if we get anything different, okay? So our kind of our goal here is to figure out which one is the lie. Oh, you know what, Cody? Can I share this question somebody had? I kind Absolutely. Of think it a little bit to your lies. Yeah. Um, are sighted children limited on the number of letters words they can read on a display monitor? Must they wait until they get older and in in order to earn the right to read full sentences? You know, that's a really great question, and I think it gets back to um, that that idea of like upgrading to a braille display. I, I think that it's a good question in that um, we don't necessarily need to think about younger students having smaller braille displays and older students have a lot, having larger braille displays. I think in an individual case, you look at the student and say, what are they reading? What is the important parts here? And what size of braille display is most appropriate? A great example for that, and it's definitely something that kind of gets to that point that you just read, Jackie, is if a student is still reading uncontracted Braille in class and they're learning contractions, but they're in class, they're reading uncontracted Braille, we're going to need more cells to get more words on that Braille display, right? Whereas if a student knows contracted Braille, right, those words now take up less cells, you know, 
that could be the case of a smaller braille display. Now, obviously, does that mean that I'm arguing for the opposite? No, it's just an example of really making sure that we take a look at the student and really think about it and not necessarily think about it being earned or being upgraded, you know. Um, but that's a that's a really great point, and I think something that that um, is really worth discussing for sure. So it, so it looks um, it looks like B. Everybody kind of thinks that B is the is the lie. A braille display is a device which you must learn to use. Um, and uh, we have some people that also think a, all braille displays fundamentally work the same way. I just want it before we. I mean, we'll we'll discuss this a little bit more at the end. But I do want to see in the chat why. Just put in the chat there why. Um, actually, let me just make sure. I might have already done this. No, I didn't. Um, why did you put the the one that you did? Why do you think the the like, go ahead and defend your choice in the chat box. If you said a braille display is a device you must learn to use, why did you say that that's, that is the lie, right? If you said all braille displays fundamentally work the same way, why do you think that's a lie? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. I'd love to hear what people think. Because although, of course, I, I made this presentation, I think that there's, a, there's one that I agree with more, but you know, all, every time that we do a presentation like this, it's always up for room for discussion. And I think it's not necessarily fi about finding the right answer, but really having the discussion and thinking through. Um, yeah, so Jackie, as those come in, if you could read those out loud. Will do. Yeah. I don't have anybody yet. I think everybody's busy thinking and typing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's kind of a hard question. I'm sure we're gonna get some, some longer answers. But yeah, go ahead and defend your defend your answer. If you thought a braille display is a device you must learn to use, why is that a lie? Or if all braille displays are fundamentally work the same way, why is that a lie? As you do that, I just want to check. Okay, that's fine. If if you guys do want to still respond to that, feel free to respond in the chat. We're going to move on to the next question here. The next oh, question. Yes, I got one real quick. Oh, yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Is running audio. Braille is not necessary until you need something from the text you can't hear, like spelling. Gotcha. That that would be the a Braille display as a, as a device you must learn to use. Absolutely. OK. All right, I can see where they're going with that. Like it's it's not necessarily you don't need the braille display. You might the braille display might be the backup. Okay, I can see that. And then somebody else responded. I actually went between A and B. I currently have a student who was able to pick up and use a braille display for reading. The more advanced features are another story. Yes, gotcha. I see. I see. And you know, I I will say that this is kind of a it's not a trick question, but I definitely have a twist for you guys on this. Um, but I like, I, I, I see where you're going there is like, it's not necessarily, I see where you're going there. I'm going to say too much if I keep talking. <laughs> I've got uh, one more. Yeah. What are their non-disabled peers using only hard copy print? Do they have the benefits of electronic display of text? If yes, don't children with disabilities need at least as much access to the text that non-disabled students get? Isn't that where faith begins? Mm, I like it, absolutely. And we do wanna make sure that we still give as many opportunities to our, our students as non-disabled peers. And that's for sure. Um, and I think when I, say, when I say this twist at the end, when we continue to go, you're gonna be like, oh, it's, I see what the point was. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that statement 100%, absolutely. Um, all right, so our last kind of poll question, our discussion question, I guess this is where we're going. Why should we use or teach Braille displays? Uh, Follow-up question is, what place does it have in our students' programs? And I'm just gonna leave it at that. I just want you guys to, to answer that as you, as you um, kind of just leave it open for interpretation. Why should we use, why should we teach Braille displays? What place do they have, I should say, do they have? in our students' programs. And then I'm just gonna, uh, that, that response was added to, audio is not reading or writing. I agree. 
not not disabled yeah. students are not limited to audio. How can we limit text for disabled students and purport to be providing faith? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I would I would add to that that um like that option, I think, is the really important part of that statement is we want to make sure that they have the option to read Braille, even if we're doing electronic text, right? If we're not allowing that option, then we're doing them a disservice. Absolutely. Using Braille displays as flexible resources for a Braille rich school environment. I love that flexible resources. Something that when the teacher changes last minute, the Braille, there's no preparation. The student doesn't have to wait for us to transcribe it. It automatically does it. Absolutely the, the benefit of Braille displays. Braille displays allow students to have access to the print in a, com in a comparable way to sighted peers for sure. And allow, allow students to have access to the print immediately, right? Well, that's the beauty, beauty of uh, Braille displays. Not all students are auditory learners and gain more information from uh, having text to read. Yeah, when I, when I taught technology at, at um, MSB, we would have, I mean, it's so clear when you have a student that's a tactile learner, when you give them a braille display and they just turn off the speech and they're like, why haven't you showed me this before, right? And they use a screen reader just with braille. Um, it's very clear that not all students, again, are auditory learners for sure. When a student relies on auditory input only, they are missing concepts such as spelling and punctuation, absolutely, which is what why, why we get um, emails from our students that are all over with formatting and spelling, absolutely. Using a braille display helps to better proofread the, proofread their text for sure, absolutely. Braille, using braille displays as flexible resources, that was upvoted, I agree, I like that one. Um, man, yeah, these are all really great. Yeah, go ahead, Jackie. I'm sorry, and then in the comment box, somebody typed, non-disabled students are not limited to audio, how can we limit text for disabled students and purport to be providing faith. I might've read that twice, I'm sorry. That's Braille okay. displays are to students with visual impairment, blindness are as monitors on computers or tablets are to non-disabled mm -hmm. students. I love it. That's definitely in the direction we're going, definitely. Um, yeah, and then Braille displays can be used to teach both contracted and uncontracted Braille. That's what I love about this. And I know everybody, you know, of course, we want to make sure that our students read can read contracted Braille. But let's say that a student, we have a student that has been learning contracted Braille for years and years and years and years, and they're still struggling with those contractions. Guess what? We can accommodate the, that by reading uncontracted Braille on a Braille display and switching back and forth. Right, you don't need two. If you're ordering a book, right, you have to decide: Are we ordering this book for contracted or uncontracted Braille? You have to make that decision, and it's going to stick. With a Braille display, you can switch back and forth. So that's it. Goes back to that flexible resource. Absolutely, um, cool. So this is a really good discussion. Again, we'll come back to this at the end uh, to to uh, come back to that two truths and a lie. Um, but in the meantime, I don't know why I just did that. I stopped sharing my screen, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah. Let me start sharing my screen again. In the meantime, let's go back to our document. Um, and we just did our two truths and a lie section. But now I want to kind of have a conversation about how Braille displays work. Um, whoever just put that that Braille displays are like monitors to not uh, to sighted peers. That is for sure how Braille displays work, right? All Braille displays fundamentally are, work on the same concept. And that concept is they don't do the translation, right? So for example, if I was going to be on this document, right? I would need something else to do the translation for me, right? What would that be? It would be a screen reader, right? Um, now I say a screen, when, we, when I say a screen reader, you might be thinking, oh, okay, like NVDA or JAWS or uh, VoiceOver for Mac or Chromevox, right? I, those are screen, re we call those screen readers for, but um, we call those screen readers, but there are many, many different types of screen readers. A great example is the Braille Note Touch, right? We did a, 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 a webinar on this last week. Uh, the Braille Note Touch has a screen reader built into it. It's called Keysoft, right? So the, the screen reader does the translation, sends the translation of Braille to the Braille display or tra translation of uh, like, you know, computer speak to the Braille display and the Braille display produces the Braille, right? So the, the Braille display is not really doing the translation. It's not doing the computing. It's doing the presentation, right? Just like 
uh, when we ask a kindergartner or a first grader and say, where is the computer? And they point to the screen, right? They point to the monitor and we say, no, 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 that's not the, that's not the computer. That's not where the computing happens. The computing happens down under the desk where the computer lives, right? Obviously in the age of laptops, that's, that fails to be the case. But you understand my point is the braille display is the monitor, it's the screen, right? It's not the computer, okay? So when we, when we uh, start to under, try to understand how we use braille displays, you don't need to know how to use the braille display. You need to know how to use the screen reader. And for every single screen reader, it's going to work a little bit different, but the, uh, the fundamental concept is going to be the same. I'm going to prove to you in this webinar that you don't need to learn how to use a Braille display. And the way I'm going to prove to you is that I don't have a Braille display, right? So I'm, I don't have a Braille display in my apartment right now. So we're, we're going to be doing a Braille display webinar without a Braille display. Well, how does that work? Well, because I can show you with the screen reader, number one, the braille display controls, and I can show you the braille display output without having a braille display. In fact, if I did have a braille display in front of me, number one, the webinar would be the exact same. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to, the, the braille display would add nothing to this webinar because you wouldn't be able to see the braille display, right? And then number two, it's, it's not going to be any different. So, so let me show you, let me, now for those of you that are like, what are you talking about? How are you doing a webinar on braille displays without a braille display? Let me show you how this works. I am just going to keep this, uh, keep this guy open, keep this document open, and I'm going to turn on NVDA. Okay. Now, if you don't know, taskbar. If you don't know about NVDA, let me turn speech mode off. I'm going to just keep speech mode off just because um, of, of the chat, because it's going to read the chat. But um, if you don't know about NVDA's Braille viewer feature, I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to go into the NVDA settings, right? So that's the NVDA key, of course, caps lock on a laptop, insert on a desktop, NVDA key plus N. And then I'm going to go down to tools. And then in tools, I'm going to go down to Braille viewer. Now, this is my effective Braille display. So that when, when you say, um, well, I want a more hands-on experience with a Braille display. Well, hands-on experience with a Braille display means plugging in a Braille display and then using it with a screen reader. And really, that the, the, that's the same as opening the Braille viewer on NVDA, right? So now, if I uh, click into this document, right? I can see in both uh, print and Braille what is on this document, right? Now, uh, people might have questions like, well, how do you change the Braille code? Because you can see that this is uncontracted, right? Uncontracted. Actually, this is in computer Braille. Let me just make sure. Yeah, this is in computer Braille. Um, so how do you change this? Well, it's not a Braille display function. So if I had a Humanware Brilliant plugged in here, if I had a uh, Focus 40 plugged in here, I wouldn't be changing the Braille code on the Focus 40 or the Human uh, or the Brilliant. I would be changing it in the NVDA settings. How would I do that? Well, I'd open up those NVDA settings. I'd go to preferences. I'd go to settings. And then I drop down to Braille. I don't need you guys to remember all of this, but I just want to show you as to prove a point. Let me drag this out of the way so you can see. To prove a point that this Braille display, this imaginary Braille display that would be sitting here on my desk, is controlled by the screen reader, not by the Braille display, right? So if I wanted to uh, switch this to English UEB, let me zoom in here because I need my magnifier. English grade one, English grade two, English, 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 English. Maybe it's under unified. Unified, there we go. Unified English Braille code two, unified English Braille code two, right? This act, this, this demonstration, and then of course I can click here into this document, Let's take a look at multiple screens, right? That screen, um, uh, screen readers, right? That screen readers, you can see now it's contracted. This proves that when you plug a Braille display into the computer, it's just receiving information, right? It's just um, getting information. It's not doing the computing. The computing is happening right here inside NVDA, right? How does this work with JAWS? Okay, so let's quit NVDA. Let me open JAWS. Goes to my email, of course. That's awesome. Jaws Home Annual, <laughs> anonymous. Um, so, let me make sure. As you can see up here, 
me switch my program focus around. Inbox left, me, the, the giver, camera, magnifier, braille displays dash two truths. Heading level two, how do braille displays work? Right, you can see up here, how do braille displays work? This is the braille viewer for JAWS, okay? I'm gonna show you how to access that just for you guys to know, right? I'm gonna switch over to JAWS. Anonymous Liger, in, meeting, the under, the giver, zoom, camera, JAWS home annual, space, speech on demand. Yeah, so I'm gonna turn that speech off as well, just for the chat. Um, but I'm gonna to go to JAWS. I'm gonna to go to the options menu. So that's Alt and O. And then I'm going to go to, I'm sorry, not the options menu, sorry. Uh, the utilities menu, that's Alt and U, right? And then I'm gonna go down to speech and braille viewer, right? And now you can see my, my braille viewer is on, okay? And that's how you get to the same thing. This shows that, again, this shows that that Braille display computation is in the screen reader. It's not in the, uh, it's not in the Braille display. So it doesn't matter what Braille display I have plugged in. Um, it's the computation, it happens on the computer. So why is this uh, being, and then of course, voiceover for iOS, right? We all know that if you take a, a humanware Brilliant, right? Anonymous raccoon has left the document. Um, if you take a humanware brilliant, right? Um, and you hook it up to an iPhone, right? How do you change those braille settings? Do you change it on the braille display? No, you change it in the accessibility uh, uh, section of the document of the uh, of the iPhone, right? On an iOS device. So all of the computation happens on the device. All right. Now things to think about. This is where we want to get into the difference between um, using computer Braille and the different Braille codes, right? Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can do with a Braille display. I'm going to turn off JAWS and go back to NVDA just because it's easier to manipulate. Can I um, ask you Yeah, go something? ahead, Jackie. Yeah. What about Chromebox? I've had a hard time before you move on. Yeah, and it depends on, and this is where Braille displays kind of are a little tricky. Um, and most of that trickiness, I guess, is um, being supported by multiple devices. So you kind of have to find a, a device or a, a Braille display that works well with the operating system that you're using, right? And the way that you do that is just reading reviews and talking to other professionals. With ChromeVox, um, the, I have heard, I, I'm, I'm a part of the like uh, Google um, ambassadors group. So Google has a, a group of accessibility professionals that comes together every, together every month and we review new Google products and we're mainly focused on Chrome OS and Chromevox. And um, there's a professional in there from Washington State School for the Blind, uh, Bruce, and uh, he has recommended in that session um, that the uh, the Mantis Q40 works very well with Chromebox. Obviously, it's really hard for me to do that without a Braille display and us in quarantine. I haven't, I, I don't know that uh, firsthand, um, but he says he, he uh, has it highly recommended to work with Chromebox. Yeah, so it's really, but it really is about choosing the device that works best with the operating system. So, yeah. Um, Cool. So what we're going to do is a couple of activities here. These activities are mainly to show you a couple of things. First, these activities are to show you what you can do with a Braille display on a PC like I have here. What is, what is it useful for? What, what are the possibilities that we have, number one? And then number two, to show you how Braille displays work and how the, the Braille codes are translated, right? The big thing that we have a problem with a lot of times is in Braille displays, when are we supposed to switch to computer Braille? And when are we supposed to be in UEB, right? And the question to ask yourself is, is the, is the uh, text already Braille translated? For example, this document, is this text already Braille translated? No, it's not. It's not in Braille yet, right? It's, it's actual text that the computer or the screen reader has to compute into Braille translated uh, or, or into translated Braille, right? If the answer is no, like in this document, you're gonna be in Unified English Braille, you're gonna be in UEB. So if I was trying to read this document and I had NVDA on, let me show you again, I would make sure that the Braille code that I was in is UEB. So I'm gonna show you that now. Meeting controls, Braille, Braille. Right? Oop. Meeting controls, Braille, Braille displays two truths. Beautiful, so I'm gonna to go to my NVDA menu again. NVDA menu. I'm gonna to go to preferences, preferences sub menu P. Then settings. Settings. 
S, NVDA settings. And then go down to Braille. Speech 2 of 13, Braille 3 of 13. Right? Braille property pick change, output table. In the output table, I want to be unified English Braille. Whether that's grade one or grade two, it doesn't matter, but we want to stay in unified English Braille, okay? Why is that? Braille display space. Well, because space. this document is not Braille translated. It's not in Braille already. Now, what do you mean by that Braille translated? I'm going to show you an instance where we are going to be taking something that is already Braille translated, and that's going to be with Desmos. If you haven't used Desmos before, speech mode off. I'm going to turn speech off. Um, Desmos is a math application. Um, it's free to use. If you want to use it, I'm, I'm logged in here, but you do not need an account to use it. You can go up to math tools um, and they have all these math tools. I'm going to be using the graphing calculator here. So I'm going to put an equation into the graphing calculator and you're going to see it's going to graph it on the screen. Y equals X plus two, right? Sure. That's my limited uh, knowledge of algebra right there y equals mx plus b, right? I remember that from eighth grade. And why am I showing you this? Well, if I was a screen reader user, I'm just going to be um, tabbing without speech just to keep the chat kind of silent. But if anybody needs speech, please put it in the chat for sure. Um, let me X this. But let me tab over to my user options, OK? And in my user options, I have this beautiful option to change my Braille mode into Nemeth. Now, you can see that my equation has translated from text into full Nemeth Braille. If you're obviously, if you are in a UEB state, you can also switch it to UEB. Now, this is very important because of course, without a Braille display, this is useless, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna turn on my Braille viewer. So I'm gonna go to tools again, Braille viewer to open up my Braille display. And you can see again, remember, I was in that non I was in that non translated braille document right so my braille code is in UEB right it's not in in a computer braille because it's non translated braille but now that I'm using desmos the question is is that text already braille translated yeah i'm looking right at braille right it's already translated and when i put my, my cursor on that braille display you can see here let me zoom in here you can see here, this doesn't make any sense. It's just gibberish. It's like letter indicator Y, uh, something, four, uh, one, three, X uh, is the plus sign and then number sign two. It's not Nemeth, it's UEB, right? So why is that? Well, because this is already translated for me. It's trying to tra retranslate something that's already been translated um, into Braille. So how do we fix that? How do we show here? How do we show on our Braille display something that is shown here? Will we change our Braille to computer Braille, right? Question is, is that already Braille translated? Yes, it is. I want to switch it to computer Braille, OK? We do it the same way as we did before. Open my NVDA menu, preferences, settings, go down to Braille. And I'm going to switch this to English computer Braille. Let me make sure I have this as the right one. English 8.computer, English 8.computer, except it's UK. So let me switch to US. While he's doing that, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, a bonus from Carlton Desmos is built in to digital tests from the College Board. Yes, and and uh, Desmos is being really widely used in math classes in the like the the College Board. Um, is starting to use it in their tests and it's so accessible there's so many accessibility features that are great um, to use so really a great tool to use if you're if you're uh, using math uh, in algebra or doing any type of math activity with your students i really recommend desmos for sure so now let's take a look at this uh, equation i've switched it into a computer braille why because it's translated braille now let's take a look at a braille display look at that beautiful Perfect, Nemeth, no translation required. Y, space equals space X plus two with no space, right? Perfect Nemeth, okay? So that's what I mean is, is when you are controlling this Braille display, you are using the screen reader. You're not using the features of the Braille display. You're using, you're, you're manipulating it through the computer. You're using it through the computer, okay? Um, yeah, let's go on to our next activity. I want to show you some books, okay? A lot of people are using, and this is really a great activity to use uh, a Braille display with, is to read books off of Bookshare, 
right? And I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. Before I, uh, before this webinar, I downloaded the book, The Giver, right? This is a book that I see all the time as, a, as an itinerant TBI in public schools, right? We see these, these books come up all the time, The Giver, right? Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, right? These classic books. So I, I downloaded The Giver and I've downloaded it in three formats, right? I downloaded it in BRF, which is of course Braille ready file. DAISY, which is DSY, which is of course that, that, um, that protected, right? Protected text file. And then of course a Word document. I'm going to start with this, uh, with this uh, daisy. I don't know which one should I start with. I'll start with the daisy file. Now, of course, to read a daisy file, I need a daisy reader, right? And on my computer, because I have JAWS on my computer, let me get all of this off. Oh, did it switch my? Uh, are you seeing my uh, the correct camera, Jackie? Yeah, I see your home screen. Your gotcha. Desktop. Okay. All right. Um, but because I have JAWS installed. Uh, I have FS Reader. If you don't know about FS Reader, FS Reader is a um, is a Daisy Reader. Okay, so if you have JAWS installed on a student computer, you can access FS Reader. It should just populate on your desktop, and you can open those Daisy files. So let me open this file. Open right. I'm going to go through, find my books folder. Of course, I don't have the screen reader on, and I needed that magnifier. Um, and I'm going to go to books. And I'm going to go to the giver. And of course, I'm going to open that daisy file. All right. And of course, there's my daisy file. Now, let's take a look at this Braille display and see when it's doing. All right. So I put the giver up there. The question here is, again, the question that I asked you guys before, is the text already in Braille? Is, is the text already Braille translated? Is this text already Braille translated? No, it is not. Right. It is not Braille translated. So if no, we're going to use UEB. So if I was reading this with a student, I would say, all right, let's switch your code into UEB, right? I'm gonna go to preferences, settings, right? And we've seen me do this before. Braille, go here, unified English Braille. Let me make sure I can see it. And we, we can do grade two. All right. Now let's take a look at our Braille display looks much better. Got all those contractions in there, okay? Now, maybe it makes more sense for you to do a Braille-ready file. Why would it make sense for you to do a Braille-ready file? I don't know. Maybe because um, there's math in this textbook book or something like that. A lot of times when I, especially for virtual learning, um, when I'm doing a braille ready file, I will, it'll be like a math test or something that I've already transcribed and I'll send my student that BRF file and uh, my student will read it on his computer with the braille display with the screen reader. If there's math in that and I want to have those beginning Nemeth and ending Nemeth indicators, I want to have transcribers notes, right? We want to make sure that it's a braille ready file, not a book. Or maybe your student is just more familiar with braille ready files, I don't know. Um, but the way that we can do that is by using a BRF reader, right? A great uh, option, actually the only option that I think I, I know of is Braille Zephyr. So if you, if you are familiar with Braille Blaster by APH, um, the, the same section of, Braille, of, of APH has made Braille Zephyr, which is a BRF reader. It's, it's kind of like, a, imagine like a Brailler on a computer, which is really cool. Um, what I can do to get to Braille Zephyr is I have it on my computer. I think I have it on my computer. If I don't, oh yes, there it is. It looks kind of strange, like it's a piece of malware, but it really is just a BRF reader. So I'm gonna open, go to open. Let me zoom in here. I'm gonna go to my documents, right? I'll use my key commands because I'm doing a webinar, right? Books, the giver, BRF, and let's open this BRF file, right? Now the question here, let's take a look at our Braille display. Oh, let me open JAWS first. <laughs> Forgot I closed NVDA. With uh, JAWS for the reason why oh. I switched, uh, and this is what I want you, wanted you guys to know, the reason why I switched screen readers, right, is because if you are using this version, I've noticed that uh, NVDA, NVDA does not support this solution. So the Braille is not correct in Nemeth when I do this solution. 
Whereas when I do JAWS, it seems to be more correct. So if you are going to use Braille's effort to do a BRF, um, use JAWS. Um, that's why I switch, switch screen readers. Okay. So if I was going to do this, the question is, is this in ready translated Braille, right? And the answer is, of course, yes, it is. In Braille's effort, the underlying Braille, giver. Right. Um, let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay. We have the giver, right? Um, and actually, Windows equals. Yeah, this isn't translated Windows Braille. Dash. So we want to make sure that it's in computer Braille. Why? Because we want the screen reader to match exactly what is on this page, right? Because it's already translated. So how do we do that? Well, we go to JAWS. Braille's ever meeting camera in the giver we JAWS home annual. We're going to go to JAWS home annual uh, utilities menu bar. Nope. I'm sorry. We're going to go to options, right? We haven't done this yet in JAWS. Alto. Menu. We're going to go to basics. Enter. I'm sorry, we're not going to go to basics. We're going to go options. I don't know Alto. what I'm saying. We're going to go menu. Braille. Voices sub menu. Braille dot dot dot. Enter. And then we're going to go to advanced. Add Braille display dot advanced dot 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 button. Enter. In advanced, we are then going to be looking for our translation. Windows table. equals. So I'm going to be going down here. One. Braille marking. To general. general. I'm going to open up general. general. Two. Go to trans. Translation, translation. close. Translation open. Three. Output computer Braille. And the output is in computer Braille, which is what I want. I know that this is kind of um, this is kind of confusing, and this is why I, I like to use NVDA more than I like to use JAWS if I'm using Braille, because this user interface I understand is a little hard to understand. What's happening here is that JAWS users will will pretty much you can see that this is the visual side, right? This is what you would use the mouse with. This is the screen reader side. Now you can go through language English all United these, States all of these options on the tree view just by opening and closing things. So you can see it says translation, right? Well, here's translation. I open translation, um, and then there's language, language, output, output, input, input, right? So it's it's just mirrored, but it is a little bit confusing. If you want to change a setting like I just did, you press the space bar. So if I wanted to change output, output computer Braille, space. U dot S, English grade one. Right, I press that space bar, it changes and it'll, it can cycle through. So let me throw it back into computer Braille. Space, 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 computer Braille. Okay, and then of course when I'm done, I can press enter. Enter. All right. Braille basic setting, win Windows dash, escape, JAWS home annual, the underlying. And of course, now I'm in my BRF reader and I can read what is on this document, which is the entire book of the giver. Okay. Lois, L left bracket read. And you can see that this is in perfectly contracted UEB Braille. Okay. So as we come to the close of this seminar, of this webinar, um, I want to turn off JAWS, first of all. Oh, actually, I want to, I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions about what we just went over, about when to change things into UEB versus uh, computer Braille, um, about how Braille displays work in general. I would love for you guys to ask any questions that you have. Jackie, any questions in the chat? Not yet. All right, cool. So if you guys do have questions about that, for sure, throw those in the chat. Even specific questions that you that uh, are troubling you or, or stumping you. Um, but now I want to take with all of this, right, with, with this demonstration, with me not having a Braille display in front of me and showing you, I want to go back to that poll. So let me turn off JAWS. JAWS home annual. Alt F4. Enter. Right, I want to go back to this poll here. So if you still are on this document, just scroll back up to the poll. I'm going to reset the uh, question of two truths and a lie. I'm going to reset it. I want you guys to answer that one again. All right. I want you guys to answer that one again. Which is the lie? A Braille display is a necessary piece of equipment for a screen reader user that reads Braille. Is that the lie? Is it a Braille display is a device that you must learn to use? Is that the lie? Or is it all Braille displays fundamentally work the same way? Which one do you guys think is the lie? And again, I haven't gotten to the twist yet. I'm so excited. <laughs> Wow, we have a lot of change here. A Braille display is a necessary piece of equipment for a screen reader user that reads Braille, we think is the lie. Yeah, I love this. Oh my gosh. 
it's so interesting to see um, how how it, the answers change, how everybody's mind kind of shifts. All right, we got one for a braille display as a device you must learn to use. All right, cool. So continue to answer this and I'm gonna start, okay, we get a little bit more movement, but continue to answer this. I'm gonna start um, talking about my twist. Um, so I, I kind of said this, I said this in a kind of a tricky way uh, for a reason, uh, just to have some fun. Um, so the one that I wrote as the lie, which not is not necessarily the wrong, the right one or the wrong one, right? It's just something that I wrote. But the one that I wrote as the lie was a braille display is a device you must learn to use. I wrote this in a tricky way. The reason why I say that is because I knew I was writing it in the in the way that a device. This is a, a device you must learn to use. This is an important device, right? That's how most people would read it. But the reason why I think it's the lie is this must learn to use, right? A lot of people say, well, I'm teaching my student how to use a braille display. And in my experience, you never really teach a student how to use a braille display. You teach a student how to use a screen reader and you how to use the braille settings of a screen reader. Just how this entire webinar was on the screen reader settings, right? Not necessarily on the braille display. The person who said the braille display is just like a monitor to sighted users absolutely is the is the right on the right track right we don't teach sighted students how to use dell monitors we teach them how to use computers right now of course there's times when we have to go in and change you know mess with those buttons on the bottom of the monitor and try to mess with stuff right but we don't need to know how to use those buttons right those that's not part of computer literacy right now people might ask me and this is where people get get um you know, they ask me questions like, well, why do they have so many buttons? It's because they're trying to sell Braille displays, right? So if they sell, if they show you a flashy device with all these different features and all these key commands and chord structures, and it can, you know, you can go into a, uh, the documents and, uh, or into the, uh, off of the Braille terminal side and you can read books on it and you can connect to different things. That's them trying to sell Braille displays. At the end of the day, those things are not part of computer literacy. It's not something you need to learn to use. Of course, you want to use it. A braille display is a device you must use for sure, or, or must consider, I should say. Um, but it's not something you must learn to use, right? It's, it's the screen reader that you're using. In the same way that a human wear brilliant works extremely differently on a Windows computer, as it does on a, an iOS device, right? It's just a different device, right? Just like if you connected, if you for some reason um, connected your iPhone to your computer monitor, it would be a different device, right? That's the exact same way you should think about braille displays. You don't teach braille displays, you teach the screen reader, whatever screen reader that is, whether that's voiceover, NVDA, JAWS. Um, if you're using the braille note touch, it's Keysoft, right? That's the screen reader. But you're teaching the screen reader. You're not teaching the Braille display. But it's very interesting how a Braille display is a necessary piece of equipment for screen reader users that reads Braille. I, I honestly, I think it is a necessary piece. And, and again, I, this is not me. Just because I say it does not mean it's gospel by any means. But I think it's interesting um, because that's that's a really good argument. It may, might not be a necessary piece of equipment for screen reader users that read Braille. Um, I've known many, many, many screen reader users that don't use Braille displays um, and are com completely computer literate. Um, now, of course, again, I, I go back to that flexibility and that option. We want to make sure that we give our students the option to read Braille because our uh, sighted students, um, our, uh, their sighted peers have that option of reading print instead of listening to um, audio. But maybe maybe necessary is too strong of a word. But it's it's good to get the conversation started. Yeah, um, Jackie, are there any questions or comments in the chat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is Meredith, um, when we were talking in class about this today, my student wanted to know if there's a better way to connect cable or Bluetooth. He's thinking that it's dependent on your internet connection. <laughs> it's it's actually not dependent on the internet connection. It is dependent on the device and the Bluetooth card that's in the device. Um, this is where really it's really hard to answer this question unless you've used the device before. Um, but I would say it's good to know how to use both. Um, I, I, I would say that always 
it's it's all well it depends it, it, there's so many factors if you're using nvda it's usually plug and play you plug the the usb cord in and it works right you don't really have to do a lot of messing around if you use jaws plug and play is not really a big thing like jaws does not is not very friendly with new braille displays so if i was using jaws i would really really try to use bluetooth if i was using nvda USB all the way. So it really depends on which screen reader you're using and which device, which actual Braille display you're using, because it depends on the Bluetooth card that's inside. Yeah. And then um, Laura said, I do feel I have to teach the Braille display with the different functions of the buttons, depending on the display. And that's, and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing that says you can't, of course, there's nothing that says you can't teach the buttons that are on the braille display but if you focus too much on the buttons they're going to come out with another braille display and those buttons are going to change so <laughs> screen readers have not changed in the last 10 years right 15 years they're they're they've come out with they're they've been better they've been more reliable they're more accessible but the way that they operate has not changed it's just like a windows computer if you focus too much on the buttons of the of the focus 40 they're going to come out with a new model of Focus 40. They're going to outline the, they're going to the scrap the entire key command structure, and you're going to have to start all over again. Absolutely teach it, but just know that that's kind of the path you're going down. Um, yeah. Cool. You say, good point. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, is there a better strap? Excuse me. Is there a better strategy to practice increasing braille reading speed along with the screen reader? Yes. Um, you know, and this is not, I, well, I am sure there is, I would say, but honestly, as a technology specialist, it's really, it's really hard to answer that because I'm not at all a, an expert on reading, actual reading braille and reading speeds. Um, and I think to, to kind of say that I was, I think would be kind of a, a disservice. Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, at this point, I don't know. I don't, I would say that you should talk to a user, an actual Braille user. As somebody that doesn't read Braille, I don't know if I can answer that question. Ooh, hard to talk for an hour. I have to get so dry. All right. Um, somebody had asked that this is more of a question for me, but uh, sure. where did you say the recordings are going to be posted? They're going to be um, posted on Maryland School for the Blind's YouTube page. So subscribe. Yeah. And um, I will get these. Um, I, my hope is to get these posted within the week. Yeah. Um, I keep my fingers crossed. So I apologize for that. Yeah, and if you if you guys um, for sure keep posting those questions, but I do want to show you some really exciting stuff that we at, at IT are um, just put out this week. If you don't know about IT, um, we we are uh, we kind of make the solution that people are looking for for screen reader uh, tech uh, for screen reader teaching. Okay, so um, if you do not. Uh, know about us, you can go to itvision.com. That's E-Y-E-T-V-I-S-I-O-N.com. And this week, um, actually on Wednesday, we came out with a brand new screen reader curriculum. Now this is like a multimedia interactive curriculum. Um, and there are student and teacher editions. So when you log in, oh, let me do this as a student. When you log in, you can go to uh, either the student or the teacher edition um, or, and you can take a mini course, which is free, Introduction to Screen Reader Instruction. Um, and as long as you make a free account, you can take a look at these, um, as well as our free resources page. The student, the student edition has all of these instructional videos, and it goes through our three methods of basic internet navigation. So you can uh, go through, and it has quizzes, it has tests. It's really, really awesome. But the real power in this comes when you have the instructor edition. This has data sheets, it has lesson plans. I'll take it to show you one of our data sheets here. So of course um, we have your assessment, your student's assessment, but then you're also given these data sheets that go through step-by-step, -step, objective by objective, what you can be teaching your student um, when they're using a screen reader, NVDA, JAWS, Chromevox. 
Um, other things that we have that are really exciting in this in this curriculum are uh, we started doing uh, mock websites. So just like if you if you um, are concerned about well where do I bring my student who's just learning a screen reader where do I uh, bring them so that they feel like they're in a safe environment not just out on the internet. Um, this course comes with. Uh, a mock website. Um, of course, we call this Navigation Candyland because we incorporate um, kind of a fun activity game in this. But you can also just use this. We had this program just for us. Um, and this is all these links don't work, right? All the all the buttons don't work, right? They just bring you to the top. So it's kind of a safe environment um, where they can navigate and they can see pictures with alt text. They can see headings. We have all these different elements and, and kind of a, a, a realistic uh, uh, website format. So if you are interested in that, absolutely make a free account. We have all these free resources as well. Um, all of the things that we've done, we have a free mini course. We have uh, all of our IT live episodes on YouTube. We have all of our screen reader cheat sheets, and we have all of our uh, free YouTube videos, things that we've done with APH, as well as some, some other stuff that is really useful, like our, our uh, partnerships with Google. So um, if you're interested in that, it's a free account. We have lots of free resources. And of course, take, check out the uh, screen reader curriculum as well. Um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions on Braille displays or, or screen readers or anything, really? Uh, no, a lot of thank you so much for doing this. This has been great. Thanks so much. Yeah, this has been really Once fun. Again, you rocked it, Cody. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Love your sessions, Cody. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. Sweet. Yeah, and of course, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, you can email me. It's info at itvision.com. I'll throw it in the chat, too. And somebody will get back to you or forward it to me. There you go. Sorry, I'm writing down the poll results. No problem. We consistently get a lot of people from out of state. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the virtual setting, right? Yeah, yeah. It's those the Facebook groups. They really oh yeah a lot. Yeah. I threw I threw this session on on one of the Facebook groups today. Okay. Just to see what happens. <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah, I um I saw earlier today it was at 39 and then like right before it was at 40. Gotcha. So I don't know if that was the contributing factor to that. I don't know. Somebody said thank you for the reminder on Facebook. Nice. Okay, cool. So <laughs> I guess that helped at least one person. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. You're free to go enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thank um, you guys so much.